I'm going to talk about global blindness, past to present, and then future challenges. I would first like to give an overview of global blindness over the last three decades, and then spend 10 minutes talking about four future challenges to improving eye health. The number of blind people in the world has increased from 31 million in 1990 to 36 million in 2015. And all people with visual impairment from 190 million to 250 million. However, if we look at the age standardized prevalence of all visually impaired people, that is blindness and moderate and severe visual impairment, the number has decreased by about a quarter from 4.6 per 100 to 3.4 per 100 people. The causes of blindness can be divided into very treatable, like cataract, easily preventable, like trachoma, more difficult to prevent, like glaucoma, and then causes for which a public health intervention are not easily feasible. In 2000, about 75% of the causes of blindness were due to treatable or easily preventable causes. This led to the Vision 2020 Right to Sight initiative with the goal to eliminate avoidable blindness from the five diseases, cataract, refractive error, trachoma, onchocerciasis, and avoidable causes of childhood blindness. If we look at the latest 2015 data, we can see that the causes of blindness have changed, with blindness from onchocerciasis, trachoma and vitamin A deficiency being reduced, and glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy becoming more important. The next two slides show the actual numbers by cause, with 56% of blindness being due to cataract or uncorrected refractive error, and 75% of all causes of visual impairment. So to summarise the first part of the talk, in the last 25 years, there has been a decrease in the prevalence of blindness and vision impairment by about 25%, but an increase in the number of people blind and visually impaired from 190 to 250 million due to population growth. At the same time, there has been a reduction in the causes of blindness from onchocerciasis, trachoma and vitamin A deficiency with non-communicable causes like glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy becoming relatively more important. I would now like us to consider the current and future challenges to improving global eye health. The two immediate challenges from my perspective are first an inadequate number of trained eye personnel aggravated by poor distribution and second, that services are inequitable, with people living in poverty, rural populations and women being particularly underserved. There are also two challenges which will increase significantly in the next two decades. First, an increase in the complexity of delivering eye services. And second, a major increase in population need. We'll now look at each of these four challenges in a little bit more detail. In 2000, minimum targets were recommended by Vision 2020 for the number of eye health trained staff. These were four ophthalmologists, 10 optometrists and 10 ophthalmic allied personnel per million population. Please note, these were minimum requirements. By 2017, the human resource situation in Africa 
for English, French and Portuguese speaking countries is still well below this minimum target. There has been significant progress in some countries, but overall there remains a major shortage of human resources for eye care. Without trained staff, no amount of money will improve the eye health of the population. That is one reason why the LINX programme has an important role to play. The second current challenge is inequity. This uh, slide shows the proportion of cataract surgeries with good outcome in the vertical axis against the human development index in the horizontal axis. As one can see, there is a correlation between poor outcome and poverty as shown by the HDI. This next slide is from a study in Nigeria. It looks at cataract coverage, that is the number of people in a population that have received cataract surgery as a proportion of all the people that need surgery. The vertical axis shows the coverage from 0 to 60%. The horizontal axis first divides the population by literacy and then into urban and rural and the coloured columns show the coverage for men and women. As one can see, the high coverage, 30 to 50 percent, is in urban literate men and women. And the low coverage in the illiterate rural population, with less than one in 10 having received cataract services. This inequity is not just a challenge for low income countries, but also occurs in high income countries. We know from the UK and USA that there are marginalised groups who do not or cannot access eye services. We now move on to the challenges which are likely to increase in the next decade. This is a diagram of the causes of visual impairment in 2015. Trachoma, onchocerciasis and vitamin A deficiency are focal diseases of poverty which are being controlled through mass drug administration programs using ivermectin, azithromycin and vitamin A, supported by primary healthcare activities, for example, water and sanitation and immunisation. Visual impairment from cataract and refractive error occur everywhere. However, we have effective and low cost treatments which by and large are one-time interventions. If we want to develop public health programs to prevent loss of vision from glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy, then we need to screen the at-risk population to identify cases, ensure referral pathways to obtain a correct diagnosis, and then provide treatment services which require compliance and long-term follow-up. Other blinding conditions, including paediatric ophthalmology, require tertiary specialist services. Therefore, the easier bit of reducing blindness, that is the easily preventable or treatable causes, is being addressed to some extent. But as cataract and refractive error services improve, the challenge of delivering eye care for chronic non-communicable eye diseases like glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy is more complex and definitely requires more resources. As we look to the next three decades, the population is estimated to grow by about 30% from 7.3 to 9.7 billion. But the population will also age with a more than 100% increase in those aged over 60, from 1 to over 2 billion. This increasing and ageing population will create a major increase in need, which if not met, will result in a two to three times increase in global visual impairment. I should point out these predictions 
do not take into account pandemics or climate change. However, not all is doom and gloom. The challenges are very significant, but there are also potential solutions. In particular, new technology is becoming available. It can be used to screen and diagnose patients in their home. It is providing better information to plan our services. And importantly, it is being used to share knowledge and expertise among eye health professionals. So to summarize the future challenges, there needs to be a significant increase in eye, eye trained personnel. Services need to be targeted at the marginalized to address inequity. While not losing the improvements in disease control brought about by vertical programs, there is a need to develop comprehensive and sustainable eye care at primary, secondary and tertiary levels. The increase in, in an aging population will be a significant challenge. Technology, if embraced and used well, can help address some of these challenges. In conclusion, Vision 2020 has been important to address avoidable blindness in the last 20 years, and there have been some achievements. But as we look to the future, we need to face the challenge of avoidable visual impairment, realizing that the numbers will be far greater and the management more complex and requiring more resources. The challenge is to make sure that all people can access good eye care to ensure good vision. The right to sight remains an important endeavor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, speaking as somebody who during the last few years has become increasingly presbyopic, uh, I now fully appreciate the concept of visual impairment. And uh, you're absolutely right in that we have to address that as well. Can we move on and invite Simon Day from IAPB to present his talk? Simon, I think I saw you there. Yes, thank you, Michael. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, I'm gonna endeavor to share my screen. Bear with me. Right, has that worked? Yes, fine. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you also to the Royal Co College of Ophthalmology and to COEXA for this opportunity. Um, the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness is the overarching alliance for the global eye care sector. Over the past 40 years, we have built a community of 160 NGOs, professional bodies, charitable eye hospitals, and academic institutions spanning over 100 countries. Together, we advocate for the policies and resources needed to achieve universal access to eye health. We believe that by working together, we have far greater chances of achieving change than any one organization can alone. We actively seek partnerships and collaboration with others as an effective means to achieve our vision. IPB divides its global network into seven geographical regions. Each region consists of their own subregions with a multitude of countries within. In this regard, we, embrace, we embrace the plurality of approaches we adopt in the, in the pursuit of our common goals, in the belief that our strength derives from diversity rather than uniformity. IPB sees international partnerships and alliances as instrumental in developing and strengthening effective public health responses for the prevention of visual impairment. In this regard, considerable efforts have been made during the past 30 years to address eye conditions and visual impairment which has resulted in progress in many areas. The Global Initiative for the Elimination of Avoidable Blindness, Vision 2020, The Right to Sight, was launched in, in 
1999 by the World Health Organization to intensify and, and accelerate activities for the prevention of blindness with the goal of eliminating avoidable blindness by 2020. The initiative has been pivotal in achieving unified and coordinate, coordinated advocacy for key priorities for action in the field of eye care at the global, regional, and national level. It has been instrumental in strengthening prevention, national prevention of blindness programs, committees, and focal points, as well as supporting the development of national eye care plans and advocating for, the stronger, for stronger evidence in the field. The Universal Eye Health Global Action, Action Plan 2014 to 19 added a further dimension around universal access to comprehensive, comprehensive eye care services and set an ambitious global target to reduce the prevalence of avoidable visual impairment by 25% by 2019. <clears throat> Last year, the World Health Organization launched, launched its first World Report on Vision. The report seeks to generate greater awareness and increase political will and investment to strengthen eye care globally. It offers clear proposals to address significant challenges in delivering eye care through existing health systems. It builds on concerted efforts of the past 30 years to propose an integrated, people-centered eye care that strengthens health systems and meets population needs. Although significant has been made in the past years, the global need for eye care is projected to surge and in, in the coming years due to population growth, aging, and changes in lifestyle. The major challenge in eye health remains the, reducing the inequality in coverage. Currently, at least 2.2 billion have a visual impairment, and of these, at least 1 billion people are being left behind in eye health. Bringing together the world authorities on eye health and system strengthening, the World Reports on Vision provides a major opportunity to mobilize the highest political support for eye health. This is a time for all of us to galvanize our efforts around a set of crucial political messages. And as IAPB, we encourage our members and partners to call on heads of state and national governments who have committed to universal health coverage and the SDGs to take action and ensure universal access to eye health. Working with our members and partners to implement the World Report on Vision Action Plan is the cornerstone of IAPB's global strategy. International organizations, donors, and the public and private sectors must work together to provide the long-term investment and management capacity to scale up integrated people-centered eye care. At the global level, it is necessary to monitor and, and influence the policies of key international and multilateral institutions such as the WHO and the United Nations to ensure a global commitment and investment in eye health. At the national level, as the movement to accomplish the ambitious goals around, it is a important to remember that policy is actualized by those working on the ground. Critically, it is necessary to mobilize political will and persuade governments to adopt and implement its recommendations and provide the resources necessary to fully integrate eye care as a core part of universal health coverage. Our hope, building on past efforts, is that we can, we can all successfully take on this challenge and achieve the vision of a world in which everyone has access to the best possible standard of eye health where no one is needlessly visually impaired and where those with irreplaceable vision loss can achieve their full potential. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. And thank you for all the work that you and your colleagues at the IAPB have been doing over many years. Um, it's a global challenge and your organization is definitely um, contributing greatly to that challenge. Um, I think, if it's all right, what I'd like to pass on now to um, two people that I've known for many years, uh, Nick Asprey and Marcia Zondervan, who will be talking about the Vision 2020 Links program. So hopefully Marcia and or Nick, are you there? Yep, we've, we've got a pre-recorded um, session coming up. If it doesn't pre-record, then we're here in the flesh. Okay.
Um, I think we better do this live, Marcia. Uh, I think you better appear live. Yep. Yep. You can't hide behind the video anymore. <laughs> Marcia, can you unmute yourself? Yes, I'm unmuted. Good. So, can everyone hear me? Yep, we we can hear you. Tell so, me. Tell so me. Welcome. Little... Okay. Off welcome you. everybody. It's. Um, so good to have um, this opportunity to meet together to look at um, what has developed over these last years since 2004 when the Lynx program began. And just um, an opportunity to look at partnerships and to look at the way forward together um, by looking at what has happened and by even with this pandemic, looking at how we can work together as partners going forward. And I just, you know, it's just such a great opportunity to say thank you to one and all for um, all the work that has gone into the development of the links over the years and the way teams have um, grown and been strengthened. Um, Nick? Yes. Um in 2004, we started the Lynx program. Um, and at that time, a number of ophthalmologists were going out to Africa and doing uh, short-term work, um, operating, uh, doing some teaching. But we felt there was a great need for uh, an organized program. And so when it started, it was based around uh, finding out the needs of the people we were trying to partner with and help. So we would send out a needs assessment, which would be filled in. Uh, we would then uh, find out the priority needs of the other hospital and match them with an institution or hospital in the UK. And it started then in 2004, we've now got 30 links and it's based on having an activity plan for three years, and being a sustainable long-term program to, to increase the, the much needed human resource capacity in Africa, as, as we all know, and has been eloquently described by um, Alan and Simon. Um, Nick, do you have that wonderful little map of all the, uh, maybe you can get it as we're talking. So we have 30 links and Nick had made a really nice map just to show everyone. Um, but there's 30 links that have developed over these, um, these years. And um, a lot of them have over the time, um, we've recognized that there was um, a, some themes, some very specific themes, for example, we had, um, I think six years ago, identified that there was uh, 15 links which were trying to develop the diabetic retinopathy um, services. And so um, through funding from the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Trust, we actually were able to pull a network to, to, to develop a network um, so that there could be shared learning. And I think this is one of the key areas um, where there has been a success is that there has been an oppor opportunity of shared learning together. And it's not just the shared learning from the UK to Africa and Africa to the UK, but shared learning uh, within uh, the regions and also at the level. And the same way was with uh, the development of the RB um, network. And we will hear later um, from various participants, we're going to hear about the networks in more detail. Um, but also with the RB net, we looked at strengthening um, through links with India and the UK and Africa and again the South-South in Africa to Africa and India um, who has already developed some in some ways um, they have uh, good programs they have excellent programs and they're also having the the late presentation. So um, a real ability to learn together to share that learning and we will see a case study of that shortly. And just just to um, add another aspect, 
one of the rather disappointing things is that there are not links programs in other parts of the world involving other countries. But we've made uh, a lot of progress in the last few years. Uh, one is with uh, RANSCO in Australia and New Zealand, who have uh, developed links and teaching links with uh, the Pacific uh, Islands, which is fantastic. And recently we've been collaborating with uh, Alliance Mondiale in France, who want to work with the Francophone countries because our links are uh, understandably uh, mainly with, with the uh, Anglophone uh, countries and, and with uh, COEXA. Um, just mentioning COEXA, there's going to be a lot more on this great link between COEXA and the college with uh, Mike and John talking soon. So we've got a lot to be proud of, Marcia, particularly you leading it for the last 16 years. <laughs> I, I think the, one of the key reasons it has had um, success is because it has been related to what the needs are from the overseas institutions. And that's wide. That's in Africa, in uh, the Caribbean, in the Pacific, but very specifically relating to what their needs are and trying to match the teams. And it's about teamwork, not just ophthalmologist to ophthalmologist, but the entire team working together. So it is really thanks to each and every link input that we have um, you know, been able to bring about a change. It is. And, and thinking about teams, um, it's so important to think about um, optometrists and orthoptists and, and nurses. And in particular, um, because equipment spends most of its time being broken down, uh, part of the Lynx team is often um, uh, one of the, uh, an expert, I can't think of the word, <laughs> in the hospital who goes, who goes out a technician and who fixes equipment. Um, and and that, that's another aspect which makes this a really practical program. So we're going to have a good day, everyone. And thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Marcia and Nick. Um, I think, as Nick has alluded to, uh, Marcia, as usual, has been somewhat modest in her assessment of her role. Uh, she has been instrumental in the driving forward of the Lynx program to the success that it is today. And that was recommended by the award of an honorary fellowship by the College of Ophthalmologists, which um, was one of my great successes as president. So uh, congratulations on that again, Marcia, well deserved. And um, what I'd like to do now is pass on to our COEXA colleagues, John and Josiah, to review their, to give us their thoughts on the co link with the College of Ophthalmologists. So hopefully the John or Josiah will pick up now. Thank you very much, Mike. And thank you, Nick and Marcia, for a very good presentation. Uh, as you know, COEXA is the College of Ophthalmology of Eastern, Central and Southern Africa. And under that umbrella, we cover 12 countries. And very soon we are looking at 15 countries in the, in the near future. Among the 30 institutions that uh, Nick and Marcia talked about, a good number is within our region under those 12 countries. Uh, in this presentation, we are not going to talk about those individual institutions that had links, links from 2007 onwards. We're going to talk about COEXA as a college. As you all heard from uh, Professor Alan Foster, without developing the human resources, no amount of money will solve our problem in eye care. So in our links with the Royal College of Ophthalmologists is mainly focused on developing high level, well-trained ophthalmologists and other teams of the eye care team. Uh, without going into much detail, I'll invite Josiah, our CEO, to present our experience as COEXA over, over the last 12 years, from 2008. Josiah, are you there? Yes, John. Um, thank you very much. And uh, it's, a, it's a great privilege to join this online community today. 
from all over the world celebrating international partnerships. And I present on the outcomes of our partnership with the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, spanning a period of uh, 12 years uh, from 2008 back then when we had the East, East Central and uh, IACO, East Africa College of Ophthalmologists that later merged with uh, OSEA, the society that was um, bringing together all the ophthalmology fraternity. So I have a brief PowerPoint for uh, slides that I would want to share and uh, I may just uh, show it on the screen uh, for our purposes. Uh, Can we all see the screen? Yes. yes. So um, today presenting on uh, the impact of our partnership we've had uh, with the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. Um, COEXA, as you've heard, stands for College of Ophthalmology of Eastern, Central and Southern Africa with a vision of uh, eye health for all in Eastern, Central, and Southern Africa. That's, that's the region in which we operate in 12 uh, member countries, uh, each of them having a society of its own. And our mission is to improve the quality of eye care through training, research, and advocacy, as well as provide leadership in eye care uh, and creating an, uh, a, a, a platform for exchange of palmic skills and knowledge, as well as resources. And um, they say pictures speak a thousand words and part of the journey we have had begins here in this photo. Uh, this was way back in 2014 in Naivasha, Kenya. And uh, I'm sure a few of us who are participating in this workshop today can see way back uh, where we've come from. Uh, this was a curriculum review workshop in 2014, and uh, this was to help in uh, standardizing the training uh, curriculum for ophthalmology course uh, within the region. So you can see all the faces are all smiles there. Uh, way back then, we started together a happy journey uh, together as a RCO uh, curriculum development lead and uh, the team from the college visiting over in uh, Nairobi, uh, in, in, in Naivasha. And uh, we all had a wonderful time. Okay, um, over to the broad areas of collaboration we have had uh, uh, between uh, COEXA and RCO that covered areas of curriculum development, examination in terms of marking and grading, We've had a few exchange visits to the UK as uh, observers. Our examiners uh, go to participate in the Royal College of Exams, Royal College of Ophthalmologist Exams, sorry. Uh, train the trainers program, the clinical guideline uh, development training, uh, CPD exchange, and also uh, lately the networks that have developed over time, the retinoblastoma network, diabetic retinopathy network, and the retinopathy maturity network. And uh, just speaking of some of the outcomes that we celebrate today, uh, we have a harmonized curricula, one for um, residency and uh, the universities that are still training under the uh, MMED system. And we also did one for mid-level uh, curriculum. Uh, that is for ophthalmology, ophthalmo ophthalmic clinical officers and nurses. And uh, currently we have this curriculum for re residency in use uh, at Rwanda International Institute of Ophthalmology. And it has largely influenced training of uh, MMED, a program in the universities that uh, are under COEXA. We've had over 138 trainers who have undergone the train the trainers course and have been able to cascade the same. Uh, that is uh, being able to advance ophthalmic education in the region. And um, because our exams, uh, uh, fellowship exams is done in a rotational basis, one of the indirect out, uh, 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 impact we've had is uh, one of the universities had 
been doing long and short cases in their examination uh, process, but they changed to uh, Viva and OSCEs in the process. Uh, so we are happy to have to, to be associated with that kind of positive change at the institutional level uh, regionally. Um, we've had uh, development of evidence-based guidelines, um, which have le led to improved clinical practice and care. For example, we have the glaucoma guidelines that have has been adopted uh, by various uh, ministries of health. Uh, Kenya and Tanzania have developed retinoblastoma guidelines. Kenya has also led in developing the retinopathy of, retinopathy of prematurity guidelines. Tanzania and Kenya both have uh, developed diabetic retinopathy guidelines with, of course, uh, impressive outcomes. Uh, I remember sitting in one workshop one time, uh, and, and I remember it was during an exam time, and I, I was shocked to see this child with an eye popping out. But over time, over four years, as we hear clinicians share, share uh, in during CME sessions, that there has been a reversal that, um, you know, nurses are able to quite nab uh, cases of retinoblastoma in the early stages and refined appropriate action is taken. And also through the CPD exchanges, uh, there's been an improvement in the clinical practice uh, through the CPDs and mentorship sessions that we have had. So these are some of the outcomes we would say we are celebrating today. Of course, not all is captured here. Uh, we will hear in the individual institutional link to link programs, uh, the impact at both individual consultant level and at the institutional, um, institutional level. Um, in terms of looking forward for us, uh, even as we see uh, the, 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 the slide that was shared by Professor Allen was quite uh, interesting in terms of the shift now from the preventable courses, uh, and we are now moving towards, you know, more lifestyle allied eye health problems. So we are looking for COEXA in terms of um, the, the, the partnership moving forward, because uh, this, this, these outcomes we are talking about would have not been possible without the partnership we have had with the Global North. So the areas we are looking at in terms of partnership moving forward is in the area of examination. Uh, COEXA is still working towards uh, setting up its own internal exams as a college. Uh, train the trainer program, the exchange visits we have had, they have helped us improve in so many areas. And also the aspect of institutional development um, moving forward. So for us really, that has been our experience and we are truly grateful uh, that the partnership has been based on a mutual agreement and understanding and cooperation. And uh, we can do more together indeed uh, through partnerships. Thank you. Thank you, Josiah. Uh, I think you went through on a comprehensive presentation of what is our impact on, of the links. Uh, without delay, I think uh, we are going to invite now Mike to tell us how painful it has been for the Royal College to partner with COEXA. Was it painful? Was it delightful? You tell us. Um, I think if it's about how painful it's been, uh, John, it will be a very, very short talk because there's been no pain at all. Um, I'd like to thank you, your predecessors, and Josiah in particular for facilitating so much of this, uh, I think, very successful link. So um, it's been a joy and a pleasure in my career to be part of this. I've now got to the age where people start asking me, um, could you tell us about your career? Um, and you start reflecting on key points, key decisions, and you sort of realize that there's an element of randomness and luck uh, involved in a lot of the uh, decisions we make that lead to where we are today. Um, I think one of the key decisions that I will always be glad I made was when, uh, with Marcia and um, colleagues from Birmingham, we were setting up a link with. Uh, our colleagues in KCMC. At that time, Anthony was uh, the lead clinician at KCMC, and I note that he's on the line now, presumably from Australia. Uh, welcome, Anthony. Uh, whilst we were setting up the link, Anthony told me about an organization called IARCO, East African College of Ophthalmology. 
Um, this caught my imagination because it was going to be at, the, at that stage an attempt has just been set up to link ophthalmologists across I think it was that stage three countries Kenya Tanzania and Uganda to provide a, a cross-border cooperation to improve uh, the standard of eye care uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and I thought that this was in itself a stunning idea uh, one that I think in Europe we would struggle with our very partisan approach to, to our eye colleges, uh, we would struggle to replicate in Europe. And I said to Marcia at that time, we've got it a car. And at that time, the thanks program, as Marcia said, it, there's, a, there's an initial uh, process by which um, the, uh, each party visits the other. So on the return visit, when Anthony came to, to uh, England, uh, also invited Chief Mugo, who was then, I think, Chief Executive of IARCO, to come and meet with our uh, president, the, uh, president of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, who was at that stage, Brenda Billington. And at that stage, um, the uh, link was started. And in 2008, a formal link was established with the ARCO with the goals of developing fellowship examinations, standardizing curriculum and training across those three countries, to provide CPD and to develop subspecialty sub training in the region. And then um, I think a few months after that link was formally uh, inaugurated, uh, a colleague and I uh, went to Nairobi. That was Peter Tiffin, who at that stage was heading our exams and he and I went to Nairobi with Marcia and we led the first training program on how to deliver examinations. And um, I can still recall meeting in a hotel in Nairobi. And I um, and said to each of the universities represented there, could you tell me how you train? And they listed their training program and their curriculum. And it was quite clear that there were significant differences at that time, both in how ophthalmologists were being trained in the three countries and how they were being assessed. And uh, there was mutual recognition that uh, there would have to be some degree of convergence if we were going to have a successful um, a COEXA examination. And I have to say that one of the great pleasures I had uh, was in two. 2015 to uh, visit Ethiopia as external examiner. At that time, um, I think there were about nine or ten candidates taking the exam. And the two things that really struck me were the, the, quant the quality of the trainees. The, the candidates there were very good indeed. Um, but equally, so were the examiners. I genuinely left there thinking that the examiners could easily slot into the uh, College of Ophthalmology exam and be completely in place and, and look like they've been doing exams for years. So I think that alone was a very successful uh, story that I think this, this uh, cooperation, this link has, has produced. Um, over the years, we've worked together and developed, helped to develop the, the curriculum for COEXA that is appropriate for Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Melanie has, as everybody knows, delivered a huge amount of train the trainers training. We've been helping with uh, uh, CPD um, and we're working with uh, GeoExa to help them to develop the, the very important regional journal that will provide the scientific platform for research in Africa. And uh, I think also over the years, I've observed, I've had the privilege of being invited to join your Congress, and I have seen it grow immensely. And I'm very pleased to say that among a joint of colleagues in Rwanda, I learned a huge amount, genuinely learned meeting. So I'd like to thank you and your colleagues for a very successful meeting in Rwanda. Um, I hope that uh, we can uh, see you all in Malawi, but that I presume is still still up in the air. Um, 
The other thing I would like to uh, just highlight is something that John said, I think in the COEXA meeting in Ethiopia. I don't know if you recall this, uh, uh, John, but at that time, you put a very strong marker down to say, we want to be independent and self-sufficient. If we cannot, if we're relying on NGOs to develop ophthalmology and deliver ophthalmology services, we will never develop our own ophthalmology services appropriately. And I said, absolutely right, John. That is exactly the aim um, that you must have. And hopefully that is the aim that uh, the link will help you deliver. So at that point, I think I'll stop talking. I'd like to thank you so much for allowing me to time. There clearly work to be done. It has been a great pleasure for myself, colleagues. They've all contributed to the program. Um, and I think I'll stop talking there and pass on to either John for the last or Melanie to the participant pub. Thank you, Mike. This is an excellent uh, uh, report on the journey we have had together, and uh, we look forward to continuing with the new president and the whole of the Royal College, because we still have a long way to go. We, we, we appreciate where we came from, but the way ahead is also a very long way, and we, we hope to continue to work with you. I think we can hand over back to Melanie for the poll. Are you there, Melanie? Sorry. Um, thank you very much, Mike and John. So as well as this day being a great celebration of what's already been achieved by the Lynx partnerships across the world, it's also an opportunity to share a lot of the learning that we've gained from that. And this sharing of learning isn't only from the speakers to all the delegates, but we definitely want all the delegates to participate in that sharing of information as well. So we, we've built in a couple of um, small group discussions so you can talk amongst yourselves um, and also some large group discussions for the whole group with question and answers as well. So if you'd like to submit questions um, to the chairs or to those discussions, you can please enter them in the chat. Um, please try and reserve the chat to everybody um, purely for the questions to the chairs because it makes it much easier for us to sift those out. Um, but also what we'd like to do is for you to share everyone's opinions with each other. And so what we've done is set up some polls um, at various points during the day um, to find out who we are, what we think um, and how we can share ideas about moving forward. So I'm going to move on to Graham and ask him to please put up the first poll. So what you need to do is um, use your um, keypad to select the answers. So it's where do you work? Um, and then you just need to um, click on the option. So it's either Europe, Africa, Asia, Pacific Islands and Caribbean, and then the rest of the world, which might be the States, Australia, and anywhere else. Right, I think the bars have stopped moving. Um, so we will end the poll there and we can share the results. So, John, I don't know if you've got any comments on that. I just wonder whether we should rerun it because only 28% voted. I wonder whether it might be worth running it longer. Right, okay, so with, okay. Trial run. Let's um, let's do that again. I'll relaunch the poll. So there's there's a lot of new things that we're doing here. Um, some of you might be familiar, others might not. Um, so we'll give you the opportunity to do that poll again. So I'm just going to relaunch that. So you should have the opportunity now to vote. Um, even if you voted last time, please vote again, and we'll just see if we can get everyone included on the voting. Well, we're up to over 300 attendees on the line um, and that looks as though the polls stopped moving there. So I'll end that.
um, and share the results. So John, any comments on that? John, can you unmute please? Yeah, Europe 69%, Africa 23%, only 48 voted from Africa. Maybe it was a challenge on to know where to vote, but I couldn't vote myself, for example. So, and then Asia Pacific, 6%, and others, US, Australia, 1%. So okay. we, are, we are covering the whole world, as you can see. Lovely. Right, so we've got a second question for you at this stage. So if we can just go on to the second one, please, Graham. Okay, so have you been involved in international ophthalmology? So there are various ways you might have been involved. Have you held a post in a different country uh, or a different continent rather? Have you performed clinical work while visiting another continent? Um, have you supported and learnt through an organization, um, a links organization partnership with another country? Um, or are you just hopeful that you might be able to be involved at some point in the future in, in some way or other? So there we go, the bars are still rising, so keep voting. There we go. Mike, perhaps I can ask you to comment on this one. Uh, I hope you can. Um, I, my, I just had a, in, un, un, can you hear me? Yes, and, we can, um, thank you. My internet is telling me I'm unstable, which I've known for years. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yes, there's clearly, I mean, I th it's, there is a risk that we may be talking to the converted, but it is really uh, very nice to see that so many people uh, have been involved in overseas uh, and uh, along. Uh, this is uh, a reason why we have a committee at the college and uh, why I think to think. Probably going to pass back if that's all right. We Great, have Thank in session, uh, provided a serious challenge to our next uh, chairs of controlling people's enthusiasm to talk about the links in five stints. So I think if we start a couple of minutes, that might help Simon and Will uh, to get through the next session more or less on time. 